Ecofictologists, welcome back to the channel. My name is Lovis and today I am delighted to introduce you to John Juncker. Thank you so much for being here, John. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, John is the author of The Tourist Trail, which I reviewed last week, as well as its sequel, uh, Where the Oceans Hide Their Dead, which I now have. Ah, nice. It arrived. Great, <laughs> very excited <laughs> to read the second one because I enjoyed the first one so very right. much. Um, John is also the author of several plays and is uh, the editor for the anthology Writing for Animals and Among Animals. Um, but to top it all off, he is also the co-founder of Ashland Creek Press, which is an independent publishing press uh, focused on publishing literature about the environment and animal rights. And so I'm very, very excited to have a chat with you. Uh, first off, I guess we'll start with the tourist trail. Uh, for the yeah. people who missed last week's review or um, are new to the channel, could you give us a brief, preferably spoiler-free summary of what the book's all about? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, I would one line. Um, I guess I would say tourist trail is about those who, um, who risk their lives. Uh, on the edges of the earth to protect animals. Uh, and that specifically includes uh, penguins and whales in this, in this novel. And, and, in, the, and in fact, the background, I'm not actually yes. uh, standing on a beach somewhere. <laughs> um, those who, who uh, read the novel will um, read a lot about uh, Patagonia, the Argentine, Argentine, uh, Argentinian side of Patagonia. And this is a photo I, I returned about two years ago and uh, this is Punta Tombo, which is the, uh, one of the largest Magellanic penguin colonies. And I included this because when I, when I went, uh, and I went with Midge Raymond, co-founder of Ashton Creek Press, uh, we, were, we went to uh, do a penguin census. Uh, we volunteered, and we, we know the, the researcher out of the University of Washington, Dee Borsma, who I would Google if you want to learn more about penguins to see the amazing work her team is doing down here. And we, it was a life-changing experience to put it mildly. And because prior to that time, if you had asked me where penguins live, I would not have shown you this background. I would not have guessed that there are penguins and there are penguins underneath those bushes back there. Uh, and I've got a few other pictures to share, but so that just to give you an idea of just how amazing these birds are and how they survive under uh, amazingly harsh circumstances. It looks absolutely beautiful. Um, I've been to Argentina, but not to the coast of Argentina. And it's, it's still on my, on my to-do list to go and see. Yes, it is, uh, it, it is an, an amazing area. And um, there's actually a peninsula near there. Uh, they're called Peninsula Valdez, which is home to you know, elephant seals, penguins, uh, orca colonies, the southern right whale uh, breeds off the coast. So it is really uh, an amazing, an amazing ecosystem. Sounds like a marine biologist's heaven. I definitely need to go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the, the tourist trail actually started out as a short story, right? And it, and it won the, the Phoebe Journal Fiction Prize in 2010? Yes. Yes, and that is, and that was the result of the trip that that we took to do this penguin census. In fact, I'm going to show you another picture. Hopefully, this will come up. Okay. Uh, and so this <laughs> was, is also <laughs> this is Punta Tombo as well. And I probably will have to get out of the way here. But uh, over one shoulder, you see a guanaco, which looks like a llama, but it's not quite a llama. And uh, that is a native of the area. And over my other shoulder is a Rhea, Darwin's oh, yeah. Rhea, seated there. And if, and if you look near the Rhea, I don't know if you can see, there is a penguin. Is it jumping little, into that little bit of... He's, yeah, he's in that little um, <laughs> pocket. Uh, there's a little dugout yeah, of soil. And these penguins, um, that's, that, that is probably a nest right there. It is not probably the most... It's not a nest you and I might choose, but they, uh, every year, they, you know, thou hundreds of thousands, about, I think there's about 200,000 breeding pairs. It has been going down, but they come to shore to breed and they will, uh, you know, the closer to shore, the better. And they, this colony stretches for miles, inland as well as, as north and south. And this 
penguin census consisted of going to these bushes and, and little uh, pock marks in the soil and noting the penguins, the, the eggs, uh, and also the vegetation. And so that was about a week and it was life changing. It, it resulted in the short story that I wrote that um, I realized after writing it, it wasn't a short story. And it ended up years later as, as the novel. Yeah, and there's, there's, I mean, I can't imagine squeezing everything that happened in the tourist trail into a short story. Um, but I was going to ask whether winning the award for the short story was what made you want to turn it into a full length novel or if it was always supposed to be a full length novel. That's a good question. I, I, I think I was just getting, um, it, de it definitely gave me the momentum. It helps, obviously. Any positive reinforcement a writer can sure. get goes a long way and I'll take whatever I can get. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it turns out that I, I had a lot more to say. I had been doing, I was uh, living in San Diego at the time, and um, another major theme of the novel, of course, is the whaling, anti-whaling activism, uh, Sea Shepherd Society, if you're familiar with them, I'm mm -hmm. sure most people are. Uh, Paul Watson uh, is, is very inspirational, and during the course of researching uh, this, this uh you know, I had been following them for years, but I decided when I decided I was going to do a novel, I actually did more research. I went to an animal rights conference in L.A. and met Paul Watson and a lot of other amazing uh, activists. And that's when that's how the novel, the novel evolved as I evolved as, as a person, if you will. And and I began to realize that it's not just seafood, it's all animals. Uh, and, and that's that's something that. That I hope the novel connects is that pretty much you, you'll, you'll be hard pressed to find someone who doesn't like a penguin. We all love penguins. It's very true. Right. But when you spend time among them and you look at, uh, they have a tough life. You know, they come ashore. They don't really want to be ashore. They do get predated upon on shore. Uh, not frequently, but it's, it's a dangerous life. And then it takes both penguins to raise chicks. They, they commute, they, they trade off they, to get food. And then when they go, out to ocean, there's fishing trawlers with massive nets that scoop up quite a few of these penguins. And so it's, it's, it became, it was very easy for me to give up seafood after that, to put it mildly. I mean, that was just like that, because I didn't really understand why I was e eating seafood to begin with. I'm from the Midwest. We have no sea at the time. And I grew up in, in, in the middle of the country, so I didn't really grow up eating seafood. But I was told that it, it could be sustainable. It was good for you. Uh, but after this trip, I was I was done with that, and that that kind of set in motion the novel, the novels, and and, and my evolution. Well, it's the emotional connection, isn't it? And and yeah. hopefully that is that is something that I think eco fiction in general can do very well is to create that emotional connection and therefore incite some kind of behavioral change, just like it did for you, even though your experience was actually being there and and um, observing observing the effects of our lifestyles on these animals. Um, as, a, as a marine biologist, obviously, I really identified with a lot of the, a lot of the topics that you're talking about, the bycatch and the, the whaling industry, and um, also the effects of tourism on, on these populations and um, overfishing and um, I was I was really happy to see it like represented in a book because often it's really difficult to create those emotional connections with issues such as overfishing and bycatch because people don't really want to know about it too much. But um, I really I fell in love a little bit with Diesel, the um, oh, yeah. the penguin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I... and he's based on a real penguin, right? Yes, he's based on a penguin known as Turbo. And I changed his name to pr protect his uh, identity. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not quite sure why I did that. He is actually, you can Google him. Uh, he is still uh, with us. Um, he, uh, if you go to uh, Penguin Sentinels or Ocean Sentinels is a nonprofit organization. I, they used to, on Facebook, uh, have post updates on, on, on Turbo. Oh. And he's, he's a penguin down there, Punta Tombo. And actually, I'll show you another slide here a picture um it's not the most uh, you know beautiful this is actually where uh the researchers live and if oh. you look over my shoulder there's a little quaver 
a, a little curved Quonset hut there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is in the novel and that is where researchers live. I, I don't know, I don't know if they still live there today. I think they actually still do. They've added, I, I believe, a structure, but it's still very primitive, uh, no running water. It's, they're off the grid in the middle of nowhere on the coast. And there's a penguin there, uh, Turbo, who returns every year with all of them. But he, for some reason, bonded to the researchers. And, and, you know, they're not feeding the birds. They're not, they're not doing anything to encourage this behavior. But Turbo just follow, follows them along, uh, follows them around when they do their research. He, he barges his way into their, into their uh, <laughs> workspace. Uh, you can pet him. He doesn't, he doesn't have, he just, he's a funny penguin. And, but he really, the, the act of naming him and also interacting with him on a, on a, a more personal level, if you will, uh, and then to think, okay, every time Turbo goes off to sea, there's a chance he might not return. And that, that really, it, it hit me personally, and I wanted to put that in the, in the novel. And it, it is, I think, the, the process of naming animals. Uh, you know, if I say there's 200,000 penguins, what does that mean? But if, if you say there's a, there's a penguin named Turbo who, you know, if there's a fishing trawler that happens to be passing by when he's out there, he's gonna just disappear for if as bycatch you know completely yeah. senseless uh it really does you know it, it, I, it hurt, I worry about him every year and i'm always glad to see updates when he returns because he's tagged right you can you can uh yeah he is tagged he is yeah. tagged so you can see his you can see his movement. you don't he doesn't even need a tag because he just <laughs> they, they all know. he just shows if up he's at the hut time. he's home he made it <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so going back to the tourist trail, um, the Phoebe Journal made a comment about it saying, the tourist trail is at once a romance, an adventure story, an environmental polemic, and a keen study of just how animalistic humans are. Um, is that what you set out to do with the book, to, to showcase how animalistic humans are? Yeah, <laughs> I think they did a pretty good job of describing it's it. Quite, it's goals. quite a... It's, a very good comment to receive. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. I, I will. Uh, put, I should put that on a business card. Um, no, it, it it is lovely, and I I it is. I do want to connect um, humans and non-human animals. You know, we we are all part of this kingdom, if you will, and the, we. Uh, it is important to to notice to to break down the barriers, so to speak. And these are artificial barriers that have been created uh, often by, uh, you know, science does a little bit of that, I have to say, uh, you know, through the, the anthropomorphism uh, word, which uh, I, I scientists are often warned against, you know, and I understand why, but I also think there are, uh, are, are dangers to, to not, um, you know, seeing seeing and I, there's a, a line i i say here I, i've said again and again I, it's in the introduction to i think among animals it, it's some the more we study animals the smarter they get and what i'm saying is is that we often assume they're they're not too bright and and then we do studies and we go wow dolphin they recognize themselves in a mirror um but because you know, we're judging them on our definitions of intelligence you know and as opposed to why, you know, what if we just assume that animals were brilliant <laughs> and then yeah. worked down from there as opposed to what we have historically done is worked from this idea of animals as machines, as, as you know, uh, non-thinking, non-feeling robots. And now we, every year it seems they get smarter, they get more emotional, they get more like us. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think science is doing a great job in, in at least uh, documenting that and showing that. But I think fiction, I know fiction, can do a great job of just cutting through all of that. And because um, we're not bound by any scientific uh, limitations. So anthropomorphism, I don't care. I'm going to dive right in and, <laughs> and do what I can. In fact, I'm going to show you another a close up of one of the uh, Magellanics. Oh, look at it. That's not turbo, and uh, but that's, uh, and he and they're not this tall. I should say they're not they're not as tall as I am. They they come up to your knee roughly, um, but they they're uh, they're an amazing creature. It's hot. It can get quite warm there. 
and they spend a lot of time uh, basically uh, shedding feathers and, and just uh, standing around, you know, raising chicks, waiting for their time to go back to sea. And they are, they are sentinels, uh, as, as D notes, because they are indicators of the health of the ocean. They, they tell us a lot. And they're telling us a lot right now. They have been, uh, this, this particular colony has been shrinking and colonies further north have been growing. And they're not sure exactly why it's most likely driven by food. Um, is it driven by fishing? We don't know. Or, you know, changing temperatures possibly. It's a fishing. The you know, the the, uh, the sources of their food are moving based on ocean temperatures possibly. There's there's all of these elements, but the penguins tell you a great deal about what's going on under the under the surface. And have they found tracks of of penguins from this colony going to the colony up north? They they have, and uh, there it's it's all. Very interesting. There's a colony on Peninsula of Valdez that is, I am told, and this is in the past year or two, is now the largest. So when when we when I wrote this book ten years ago, this colony of Punta Tombo was numerically the largest. So that would indicate that they are adapting. Um, oh. And 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 D and D told me that um, the the history of this colony uh, apparently a hundred years ago this colony didn't exist there that uh, Darwin, when he visited, didn't make any notes. So there, there's an assumption that, it, it, it's a, that these penguins can, are continually moving and following the food. And um, the book is published by Ashland Creek Press, which uh, you helped to found. So let's talk a little bit about the publishing house because it's so exciting to, to see a press that's dedicated entirely to eco-literature and um, environmental literature and animal rights. Um, on the Ashland Creek website, the answer to the question, why should I submit to Ashland Creek Press, uh, mentions that the traditional publishing is undergoing so many changes and doors are closing to uh, some writers um, in some areas. Do you, would you expand a little bit on what some of those areas are that are closed? Well, um... The publishing industry is definitely going through changes. Uh, well, and with the with the pandemic, especially, it's been really challenged with bookstores closed and um, and whatnot. Um, but the, it has consolidated a bit, so that historically there was a lot more there were a lot more opportunities for what quote unquote mid mid list writers. So the large publishers would would definitely. Um, spend, invest more money and more time in nurturing writers' careers. And so you could publish a book, uh, maybe sell five to 10,000 copies, and actually have a shot at a second novel. And nowadays, that's really, really hard. They, okay. it, it's a very tough industry. Um, and, and it's also publishers, and, and they're, they're, these are businesses, these are large businesses. Uh, what I learned when, when I wrote The Tourist Trail, I had an agent and she tried to sell it and she took it to all the publishing houses. And there was a recession going on, so that was part of it. But also this novel is you know, eco-literature. There's If you go into a bookstore and ask for the eco-fiction section, there is no <laughs> eco-fiction section, right? Okay. Uh, so it's a, it's a more challenging book to market. It certainly was 10 years ago. I think now it's it's slightly easier to market, but that that was uh that experience i i first self-published the tourist trail because i have a background in publishing and, and mitch my partner does as well so we said well let's do it ourselves and then we realized you know there's probably some other writers out there having similar challenges and you know ashton creek press came about it, it's a labor of love we we work from home we we don't publish too many books but we because uh, we're also writing our, our own work and uh, but it's been it's been a great uh, it's been very rewarding and it's uh, it's it's helped us connect with a lot of writers that that we admire as well and it's it, we view our press as both a, a, a you know publishing house but also an act a work of activism in itself because we are trying to say our view for environmentalism is is important and 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 we call it new environmentalism, if you will. It's less, it's, we don't believe in hunting and fishing and, and those historically have, have fallen under the umbrella of, an, of an environmental literature, uh, but we don't subscribe to that. So we're a little more 
progressive in that regard. And of course, we're vegan, so we don't, you know, that's a whole other element that we're very passionate about. And so it's it's been a, it's been a quite a journey, and um, it's it's a growing field too. I'm very pleased to see there's a lot more people nowadays. Uh, of all ages waking up and saying, you know, we need to do something. Obviously, you know, here in Oregon with the fires uh, and California, the whole West Coast, uh, you know, climate change is absolutely real. And we can all as individuals do things. And that's, we, we, we have a very optimistic, even though we are in ch very challenging times and across a number of levels, um, we, we remain very optimistic uh, that if we all collectively do our part and, and there and a lot of different ways uh, we can make a difference and that's all it's about you know it's we can't necessarily snap our fingers or ask for the government to do something the government is doing very little right now uh, but we can do something and and that's what we're all about that's wonderful do you think the the messages, I mean, some of the messages in, in the tourist trail are quite confronting, aren't they? They're all the animal rights and veganism and, and the whaling industry and sustainable fishing. Um, do you think it's difficult for, for authors to publish this, this, these kinds of topics because publishers don't think readers want to read them or um, publishers don't want to necessarily push their readers that much or... It is tough, and and I it, that's why we exist as a press because we don't we actually want to see these types of books. We, right. we welcome them with open arms, uh, but there aren't. It, it is tough if you go to a larger press with the the, the idea is that they want to get to you know sell to the largest possible audience. They're going to dilute that. Um, they don't want to offend anyone, and it's like any form of entertainment. That, you know the idea is don't have too many sharp edges and um, and. You know, I, I, I understand that, but I also think that we are, it is a business, but it is an art and it is, a, it, it is activism. And it is, I, I also think that I, what I tell authors is think about, I, I take a long view on, of history. And I think about what, a lot of times we look at old novels and we go, God, they, they, didn't, they were really backwards thinking back then. You know, uh, they used to, any number of, point in ways of viewing the world were really backwards looking. And I think a lot of way, I know a lot of the ways we're looking at the world right now are very backwards now. And we will, as, over time, come to see that. And, and many people in the, in the environmental movement already see that and they're advocating for, for dramatic changes. So that's what we're about. And we may not have a large audience now, but I think, I, I know the audience is growing. I've seen it. Um, and particularly among animals. Uh, we, we have a book called Writing for Animals, like you, you mm -hmm. mentioned. A lot of universities have picked that book up. So really? it's interesting. The whole animal studies movement in universities has really been taking off. And it's not just within writing programs. It's, it, it's interdisciplinary. So you get uh, people in science who are, who are also doing writing courses because they want to improve their writing. So the, the, a lot of the literature that we're, we're publishing and, and advocating for is, is resonating. And I, I, that's, that's why I'm optimistic, despite uh, a lot of reasons not to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've received a couple uh, comments and messages from, from viewers saying that they are either taking a course or creating a course that is focused on ecofiction and how it can um, kind of explore the different paths that we might take or um, prepare, prepare people for the kind of life that we might have if we right. continue on our course and do nothing. Um, yeah. So it's really interesting to see that it's that it's being incorporated into universities. It's being taken seriously. It's going to keep growing, and that's really absolutely that's really heartening. It is. It is. Um, even though the description of what Ashland Creek Press publishes um, might sound quite restrictive to some, if you're talking about just environmental literature, um, you actually publish a wide range of books fiction and non-fiction um what do you think fiction brings to environmental literature that non-fiction doesn't does it access a different audience or um yeah create a different experience i yeah i yes and yes it, it access often accesses a different audience through it's particularly if you focus on genre you know we have a, a ya trilogy 
uh, that is uh, has a vegan message, but it, it's um, it, it's a vegan vampire trilogy, if you will. Oh, uh, people that are into <laughs> vampires have have discovered it's a young adult trilogy, although it, it's it, it cuts all the way up to adults, and it's a great it's a great series. It's set in Oregon, and so if we, we there's a lot of people who are just like vampire now and vampire trilogies and they they read that and they get a little bit of the environmental message and they, they but it fits under that genre um we have so we do ya we have thrillers we have more serious fiction but yeah i i, I think i say uh eco fiction is fiction with a conscience so to speak i, I do think there there is a message there is a point of view um and we do have to be careful as writers, and and I that criticism I've I've heard for for my work is some some readers just don't want to be preached to, um, and I understand that. Uh, but I do think you can tell a good story and and deliver that message at the same time, where people don't realize they're being preached to per se. Because mm -hmm. you know, if you don't have anything to say as a writer, you probably shouldn't be a writer. You know, I, I, every writer is saying something, is preaching something. They may not be preaching. The, the challenge is if you're preaching something the reader doesn't want to hear. That's the issue. That's when you get accused of preaching. Um, mm -hmm. If the reader wants to hear what you're preaching, then that's not an issue. So the challenge for what we we're writing is how do you reach across to people who may be inherently uh, opposed to what you're writing about. And, and I know with the tourist trail, I, I have been surprised a lot of people that are not politically aligned with what I, what I'm, my views, not vegan. I've gotten a lot of great feedback from the novel, and they and they say, you know, I, I eat fish. I I'm now I'm rethinking that. I'm rethinking eating oh, fish. Wow. Um, There's they may not be vegan. They don't care about that. But they're they're if I can just reach them a little bit, you know, just kind of break through a little bit through a good story, you know, and, and and ultimately it comes down to the characters. Are these characters people that? Um, the reader can relate to and when, when i talk to writers one thing i say is you you have to we, we i talk a lot about empathy you have to be empathetic to people that you disagree with and disagree with you you have to i wasn't always vegan and so i'm writing to to my old self you know in a way that i because i never if you had asked me when i was in high school that i would give up eating meat i would have laughed I, <laughs> I'm from St. Louis, for crying out loud. We, I was raised on barbecue. Uh, you know, I, but I, here I am today. So how did I get there? You know, everyone's going to have a different path. And, and my goal as a writer is to create characters that are not perfect, that are flawed, that are like all of us, and that hopefully the readers can connect with them. And it's, it's, this movement is not about being perfect. I, I, I cringe a little bit when when there are purity tests and and so forth uh, about environmentalism because i feel like that that's not doesn't do a good thing for the movement i think everyone can do something and should do something but to ask everyone to be perfect is probably a little too much because i'm not perfect and i don't think i'll ever be perfect and i might not eat animals but i i drive a gas-powered car so mm -hmm. i'm not perfect uh you know i i fly in a plane uh, not lately, but I, yeah. I have. No. <laughs> so you know what I mean? It's it's not, I, I think the most effective fiction are, are those where you create characters that the characters themselves, a the message might not resonate globally with everyone, but the characters can resonate. And I think that's how you, you can reach people where nonfiction cannot. Absolutely. And uh, what you said there, it's a uh, fiction is, is, reading with a conscience right and and on your on your website i just love it it's across it it says read like you give a damn yes. <laughs> i do like that that's, that's my shirt oh right you're wearing here. the shirt I, uh, <laughs> that's very fitting that's very yeah. fitting and you see yeah. that written across the the eco lit site which is where people can go to buy uh books such as the tourist trail and everything else that the ashland creek press publishes correct um, it's an independent online journal that's dedicated to, to books on uh, environmental and animal protection, which you started in 2012? Uh, yeah, I guess. I don't actually remember. <laughs> a few years after the press, yes. Okay. What, what motivated the creation of the, huh. the blog? Of the, the, it's the... a blog. It's a literary. Uh, it's a yeah, it's an online community, a journal. It's for it's for writers and readers, and we 
I think I, I, I think we started it, you know, we tend to generally start things because we go, why, why isn't there such and such out there? Mm-hmm. And then instead of complaining about it, create it. And we did, we, we, because we believe in not just promoting our own work, which we do through the Ecolit, but we also promote a lot, all presses, any, and in writers who are focused on these issues. So if we're passionate about a book, um, we'll review the book. And we have about five or six contributors focus on different types of books, poetry or uh, children's uh, literature. And, um, and they just contribute as they read books that, that, are, that speak to them. Um, and then we also uh, list write, writing opportunities. So we have a long list of, of literary outlets for environmental writing about environmental topics. It can be fiction, nonfiction, et cetera. That was something that I wanted as well, because I submit as a writer, I write short stories and plays and, and I'm always, always wondering, you know, I always want just one space spot that I can go to, to look for all the journals. And, <clears throat> and so now I have it. Yeah. And it's quite popular actually. I can imagine. And it runs its own competition, doesn't it? The Siskiyou Prize? Well, the Siskiyou Prize, the Siskiyou Prize for New Environmental Literature is through Ashton Creek Press. We, oh, is we it? have gone okay. through that. And we started that, I, I guess, about eight years ago. And once again, this goes into this idea of, of being a bit of an activist. Of We wanted to create an award that, in, that, that inspired writers who are focusing on this idea. That this, we're, we're really promoting this idea of new environmentalism. Uh, because when we... One thing we realized for Ashton Creek Press, we were getting a lot of submissions from hunters and fishermen, mm-hmm. uh, you know, fishermen and fishermen, and 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 there's nothing wrong with that. If that's what they want to write about, that's great. But that's not what we want to publish, you know, unless it's a book about someone who's evolved from that and realized, you know, because I fished when I was young, and I actually felt guilty about it even when I was a kid doing it. But I did it because that's how I bonded with my dad, and that's what young boys did, and. And hunting was something that you did to become a man. And so now I'm at a point in my life where I realize that was, that was you know, that's a cultural, cultural conceit that I was raised into that I wasn't even comfortable with as a child. And I'd like to see more writers come out on the other side of that and say, you know, maybe that's something that needs to change. Because if everyone hunted and everyone fished, we'd have no fish tomorrow and we'd have no animals tomorrow, basically. Uh, you know, we can't, it is not sustainable, period. And we can't, there's this whole idea of ethical, sustainable fishing, you know, uh, it, it drives me a little bonkers. Um, like, uh, well, one thing that, I, an aside, is sustainable uh, uh, monkfish, is it, uh, uh, and you're in, and any fish that lives um, to a mile or so below water, below the ocean, mm-hmm. the ocean, on the floor, basically near the ocean floor. Anyone who can say you can sustainably fish something you cannot actually monitor well, it, that's a dangerous uh, uh, assumption, I would say. Um, yeah. but, but anyway, uh, that's an aside. Um, but so yeah, I, uh, the, the prize, um, we're gonna lo- open it again. We do every other year and it, we offer a thousand dollar prize and we, we don't require publication. It can be previously published. It's, it's an option to publish with us, but we don't want to lock anyone in because some writers will get an agent and want to go to a big press. And that's, we want writers to be free to go to, the, to wherever they want to go with, the, with their manuscript. We have published one winner uh, in, in uh, Katie uh, Yoakum's book, um, um, The, the um, Three, ways to, the three ways to Disappear. I did review that. I loved it. Oh, I loved a great it. novel. I know she's a great author and we were thrilled to, to, to be able to publish that, that novel. So it's, and it's just a way of us trying to um, encourage more writing and to provide another award. And, and it's, and it's been, it's been popular. It's been a popular contest. It's, it's a labor of love. Again, it's not something we do to make money. It, it, it doesn't, <laughs> but it is something <laughs> we do to just show that we are committed to this field of, of writing and we want to uh, encourage more writers. Well, thank you very much for doing that. I very much enjoyed Three Ways to Disappear and I'm, I've, got, I've got several books from Ashland Creek Press waiting oh, to be read now. Great. So I'll be, I'll be busy for the, for the next couple <laughs> months, I think. They will be appearing on the channel at some point, I'm sure. Um, 
I've just got actually one more question for you. And um, I just thought I'd ask you for a couple of recommendations. Um, obviously, I can highly recommend the tourist trail. And even though I've not read it, uh, the, the where the oceans hide their dead, I'm sure that's wonderful as well. But I just wondered what's what's caught your attention recently? Well, I, I it, it's going to sound highly biased, but I would re recommend Midge Raymond's novel, My Last Continent. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that trip that Midge and I took uh, inspired two novels, mine and hers. And hers was published by a big press, uh, by Simon & Schuster. And it's an amazing novel of, um, and it's not a spoiler to say that there's a shipwreck in Antarctica, but it's, it's an amazing novel and it, it, it definitely is one of, up there with me. Um, you know, what, what novels? Um, Gosh, I'm trying to think. Well, uh, this is Sorry, not an I put American you on the novel. spot. <laughs> Helen, a recent novel, I, Helen Garner, um, The Spare Room. Is an, she's an Australian novelist. It's a very sad novel. Uh, it speaks to me for a variety of personal reasons, but it's a, it's a great novel. Um, what have I, you know, the classics, I, you know, I'm trying to think of books that I've read again and again. Uh, you know, Moby Dick, even though that's a brutal novel to read and tedious at times it i really admire i will always admire what he was trying to do and i do believe it was an, it's an environmental novel and i actually believe it's an anti-whaling novel i don't believe he was he i don't believe he was glorifying whaling so much as struggling with the practice of it and and because it, it was a, it is a gory horrible practice of uh, of killing some of the most intelligent creatures on this planet uh, and it continues tragically to this day for yeah. no reason. Those for are no some reason. of the parts of the tourist trail that made me really kind of. Oh. Yeah, it's hard. It's heavy. It's very heavy, and it's and you know God, you know, thank God for the Sea Shepherd Society. I mean, they, you know, they're they're out there fighting the good fight, and it. I really believe when I wrote the tourist trail that whaling would be over by now. I really thought so, and it's not over. And it's still happening, and there is no reason for it to happen. <laughs> and so, so much still has to be done, and and that is why we are doing. It's why you're doing what you're doing, and and why I'm doing what I'm doing, and and um, and thank you for promoting environmental literature because this field needs to be here, and it needs to grow, and more people need to read it. I agree, and uh, yeah, I just I'm, I've so enjoyed um documenting me discovering the the genre because i only kind of discovered it in march or something right before i started making started doing the channel so when i when i stumbled across it i realized there's this whole genre that i didn't even know about even though i'm probably one of you know i'm quite environmentally minded and uh, i'm aware of the issues i work in conservation often um and i didn't even know that the genre existed so it definitely needs some more yeah some more publicity <laughs> yeah and and, and actually two more novels let me um I've got them here if i know you've heard of uh i don't know if this will show up but the overstory Ooh, the overstory richard mm -hmm. powers um and any this one i actually like for other, any Peru, uh, bark skins, also about uh, trees, if you will, the history. It's an epic, truly epic novel. And it's a great novel. And, you know, there's, there's a lot going on right now. A lot of these uh, excellent writers now are, are really starting to devote, devote their energy towards um, environmental destruction. And, and also the battles being waged. You know, Richard Powers talks about the tree sitters and a lot of what he's writing actually happened here in Oregon and Northern California and, and continues even now. So this battle is not historical, it is contemporary. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well that about wraps us up in terms of what I wanted to ask you. Um, I will of course be leaving links to everything that you've mentioned and everything we've talked about Eco Lit, as well as Ashling Creek Press, of course, in the description below so everybody can find you and uh, find where to buy all of your books. Um, so all that's left is for me to thank you so much for, for joining me on the channel and uh, for taking the time to talk to me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you.
Um, so that's it from me, and I'll see you next week, eco-fictologists.